Welcome to the Mental Models Podcast. I'm George Baxter, and I'm a hedge fund manager for SaberPoint Capital Management. I'm Dan Krawczyk. I'm a neuroscientist and professor at the University of Texas at Dallas. And together we explore mental models. That is how we view the world and what the world gives us for feedback. It's not a brain in a jar. That's the gist. We really appreciate you taking the time to listen to the Mental Models podcast. We would like you to continue to support us and uh, our efforts here and show us that you do appreciate uh, the information that we share. Uh, And you can do so by buying our book, Understanding Behavioral Bias. It's available on Amazon, and and if you do buy it, what would really help us out is if you could leave a review. It's available in paperback copy and on Kindle. Both are pretty good value, and we think that uh, you can really explore some of the topics that we touch on here in greater depth. Thank you very much, and we hope you continue to enjoy the Mental Models Podcast. Welcome to the Mental Models Podcast. Today, we are going to cover the elusive topic of value. But before we get into that, we would like to encourage our audience to participate. If you guys would, please do like our podcast and leave any sort of reviews or comments that you may have so that we can provide you with a better product. It's all about value. That's right. <laughs> so this is one of these challenging topics. Value goes so deep within the brain. Let's start with that. The mammals overall have these reward systems that are generally geared toward foraging, areas like the basal ganglia. So people think about dopamine in association with reward. What dopamine really seems to be about is learning based on rewards. We have this sort of very finely tuned set of circuits in our brain that will respond toward what predicts a reward. And that system's also responsive when our predictions fail. So in in many ways, that's about guiding our behavior. We also think about the amygdala as a region of high emotional salience, essentially an area that's involved with just reading the value of a particular situation or object or even threatening movement. So it's often a screening for threat, but can also be a system that essentially is a gateway to our attentions. We call these subcortical systems. We don't have a lot of conscious insight into what they're doing. They're very fast and automatic, and they often form the basis of what we think of as instinct and intuition. Yeah, it's interesting because our notions of value, of course, play a lot of influence in market. Value is essentially essentially a mental construct. It was much simpler when we were hunter-gatherers roaming the plains and you had to attend to your most basic needs, food, shelter, warmth. Things had value based off of their utilitarian need. But as we've grown more complex and our world is more symbolic in nature, value is more subjective, also more of a group-based perception. Such a deep topic because value has become more abstract and group perception based over time as societies have grown and as uh, economic systems have grown. So in the scientific world, we call them primary rewards if they're about survival needs. We then have secondary rewards, which are basically proxies for survival needs. And then you could go up the line to kind of higher order rewards, which are more about appreciating group dynamics and altruism and all these very sophisticated human values. So one of the first studies I did on value you was looking at the effect of financial rewards and penalties on memory performance. And so we just basically had people do a task where they would have to remember different faces or different scenes or objects. When there was money on the line, not only did you get those sort of amygdala and medial frontal cortex circuits active representing the reward, but it had another effect. It basically amplified signal within those memory regions. So you get the sense that rewards really take over the brain. They have an initial input from these sort of primitive systems, but then they can embellish our behavior and our motivation very broadly within our big cortex. So that's the really the workspace for uh, how we mold and shape all of these sophisticated abstract forms of value. It's interesting, you know, there's an old learning mechanism that people tend to use when they first start investing, individual investors, they start doing paper trade, or they write down uh, what they would do under certain circumstances. Another analogy to that is playing poker, where there's no 
value in the chips. You're just playing for chips. And people's behavior is so significantly different under those circumstances. Their willingness to go and take risk, for instance, versus those when what they're actually playing for is real money. That takes on a whole different character, just thinking about the other people involved in the transaction. So value is a very social phenomenon. We have obvious social rewards or penalties in the form of facial expression. So if I make a frowning face, it's uh, it's a big clue to you know, something may be off. Or if I'm smiling, as I often do as you make your remarks, um, that's some reinforcement that, yeah, this is, uh, this is something I agree with or I find interesting. And so we read people all the time, and different objects and different situations can take on different value depending on what others' perception of those are. And so that dynamic and interactive element, it gets very much into what we think of as perspective taking. Yeah, it's it's interesting. I, like, for instance, I have a coffee cup that's right here before me, and then we could talk about what the value of that coffee cup actually is. We could base that based off of the cost that it took to be able to manufacture, distribute, and bring that coffee cup to me so that I could use it, or the value of the utility that I could actually get in using the coffee cup to hold my coffee so that, you know, I don't have to go and use something like my hands, it would be very painful, very you know, and very awkward. I got, I got in a lot of trouble last time I did that. For instance, if it's my coffee cup, that's probably worth one thing. But if it's Warren Buffett's coffee cup, well, then people would probably pay a little bit more just because it's been touched and used by Warren Buffett. Uh, so there is a lot of times it comes with a social connotation associated with it, prestige. And if you were to bring it back to the hunter-gatherer, prestige was important because of your perception within a group, which may affect your access to food, mates, things of that nature. And that probably goes to why chiefs of tribes would have certain uh, headdresses or, or objects that were that were associated with them. Here at the university, our president takes out the mace, which is not a weapon, but rather just a big staff, essentially like a wizard. And the mace for the University of Texas at Dallas has a, uh, a rock from outer space because we have some former astronauts who are associated with the university. So that takes on a whole set of values and like a tribal marker of I'm the leader of this group. And it's interesting is he used that in conferences. They pass it around like the conch shell and uh, Lord of the Flies where you get to hold the mace. And Only when talk. he really wants to assert his authority. Doesn't happen too often. With regard to coffee cups, so I happen to have a uh, Boy Scout uh, coffee cup that's branded. So it's from summer camp last year and I have the pleasant memories of going to the branding station and getting the Kaya Kima brand on this mug. And so when I look at my mug, it has a lot of autobiographical significance and it has some memories associated with my son who was there as well. And so there's a case where it's not so much that most people find this very uh, value free because <laughs> it's just a plastic mug. But to me, it's significance. Our brain can really infuse something with value. So there's sort of this difference between a socially agreed upon value and a personal value. We have something called protected values or sacred values, which are these things in our lives that we won't compromise on. You know, if our life was dependent on it, we might not compromise on this. And that's throughout human history. Those are rather interesting as well. And sacred or core values tend to be those features of a group living. It's usually a value for your family members or relatives. So some of the highest value we place has to do with the social group. Yeah, and it's interesting. It all kind of can be related back to the necessity to preserve and perpetuate your DNA. Uh, we think in terms of some of our most important values, family certainly comes to mind. Those people share our DNA. And then you know, some people will extend it to their immediate community. And quite logically, more of your DNA is within your community. The more dispersed that becomes, the further out, the less importance that it probably has to individuals. That's a term called inclusive fitness from the evolutionary biology world. And what inclusive fitness describes is exactly what you, you said there, that uh, we tend toward helping our uh, genetically close relatives. And uh, other species do this as well. So gazelles will do this behavior called stotting, where they leap really high when a predator is nearby. That doesn't make much sense from an individual standpoint, right? Because you're sort of advertising, here I am, to the predator. One of the theories is that claim of robustness, you don't want to chase me because I'm so strong. Another thought, though, is that gazelle is distracting the predator from going after their family members, thereby gaining fitness because the family goes on. Yeah, it is fascinating when we think about values and we think about how malleable they could be. People tend to have a really concrete notion of money. So dollars, for instance. We all know that dollars 
they're either bits within a computer or just pieces of paper. But I don't feel very nonchalant about just dropping them on the ground as if they had no worth to them whatsoever and walking away. We recognize some value there that is communally held. And it's fascinating when you look at circumstances where the confidence associated with a currency or a stock or asset class in general becomes undermined and how that affects both the perceived and actual market value associated with that particular currency or asset class. I think we're seeing this now with Bitcoin, right? It's out there. I think there's a feeling people don't know what to make of it. It seems futuristic and like it's going to possibly take over society, but there's some risk involved with it. And it's interesting. It's called cryptocurrency because it is a very cryptic feeling because it's not tangible in the way that paper or coins are. Yeah, no, cryptocurrency has certainly stimulated this notion of what we regard to be as value. The predecessor, of course, to cryptocurrency was gold. People would become very concerned about the ability of the Federal Reserve to be able to print money and then go out and flush it into the economy through buying treasuries or restrict the monetary supply by selling treasuries. And they embrace this notion that currency only has the value to the extent that the sovereign is recognized. So to insulate them from the risk associated with the sovereign that issues the currency, they would go and buy gold. And then as time has developed, given the encumbrance associated with gold, it's very heavy. It has a terrestrial form. So you have to have a lot of security around it. There's storage costs and things of that nature. People have started to think of alternatives like Bitcoin as another means to be able to preserve the value that they fear they may lose in fiat currency. And it's really not all about money. There's there's a he- heavy perceptual element to this, both in society and what others are thinking about perception. We had done some really interesting work, which is about to be published in, in the journal Social Neuroscience. Adam Teed was a former student of mine who's the lead author on this. And we were doing a brain imaging study of very abstract values. So the value of helping someone in need, you know, helping underprivileged children, these sorts of charitable causes, which most of us have some value that we place on, especially as we get older and have more means to help others. Helping others becomes a very impactful sort of value, but we don't do it all the time. So why not, right? We discriminate here because there's only certain groups will help in certain ways. And so the core of the study was looking at, we'd have people judge the worthwhileness of a particular action, such as building homes for the homeless, let's say. They would also get the same kind of judgment with, would you participate in this action? Which puts a whole different spin on it. So in one case, you can say, yes, that's a, I can see the value of society should do this. But what I personally take my time and my energy and sacrifice other activities for doing that, that activity. Turns out the activities where you participate, an area called the temporal parietal junction activates, that's associated with perspective taking or theory of mind. So this very abstract kind of sense of how I interact with society comes to bear on that decision to really charitably give over just the cases where you rate the worthwhileness of an activity. Yeah, and there's there's always been that question of uh, what is it that an individual is getting out of charitable giving? Is it that they're recognizing the good or the benefit is being received uh, is one of the group and therefore they're identifying with the group as a whole? Or is it that they themselves see that they can get some prestige as being a charitable giver or it generates within them some sort of feeling that is quite positive. And so that stimulates their desire to go and provide that charity. And this happens when a building is donated, your name goes up in big letters on the building. So again, there's the benefit to the society, but then there's kind of that prestige factor that comes along with this. So we're always in favor of donating, all giving is good, but sometimes there's an ulterior motive or a bonus that you can <laughs> you can sort of get some recognition here as well. I think in a lot of cases, it's not black or white, there's a blend of these different forces at work uh, where people do feel tied to their community and they do see the good that they're providing as being beneficial for both the community, but they also receive prestige within that. One thing that's really interesting when you think about finance, a lot of people in finance have more money than they will ever need, but there's an ever significant desire to have even more. The manager of a $200 million fund may be envious of the manager of a billion dollar fund and the manager of a 
billion dollar fund may be envious of one that has 10 billion. And so it's like the very, very hungry man with a very small mouth that can never get enough, despite the fact that uh, they're completely obese. And I would say that the answer there is one of status and prestige, that they're rating themselves based upon others and they want to have an even higher rating and there's never a net for them. That's that's right. We are motivational primates. Uh, once we have a comfort level, there's always someone else who has more. And we're into a realm where uh, some people are so wealthy that uh, you think of the art market as a really great example of value as well. Art has aesthetic value unto itself. I was in Paris and saw the Mona Lisa and a huge part of seeing the Mona Lisa is the social experience of these 25 or 50 other people all crowded around and now taking selfies with a portrait. And so in some sense, there's this shared value that's so famous that it somehow stands out in our mind very differently. And if you think about a lot of the famous artists, it's such a a finicky market and it's just derived from whatever the going rate is. So, you know, when a famous painting sells, it, it anchors the value for the next famous painting or other aspects of that person's work. Another really fun example is the Stradivarius violin. So these are exceptional pieces in terms of their sound quality and materials and craftsmanship, but they also take on a lore about them. Everyone knows of that type of violin. The name is alone, has its own value. And some of them, it turns out, have been stolen over the years and recovered. So the the little histories actually add to the value also. So all of these sort of storylines and narratives can bring the value upward. So it's not just a signal of wealth, but a story that you can tell as you show this object to other people. Yes, it's a symbol. And it's all, all of this is very symbolic. I'm reminded of a time when I went to a charitable event when they opened up the new Nebraska Furniture Mart here in Dallas. And Warren Buffett was there. My daughter is a huge fan. And she got to meet him and take a picture with him, which was a big highlight for her. Then they had an auction. And one of the things that was auctioned off was a signed Warren Buffett ukulele. Initially, the bidding was quite low at, oh, a thousand or a couple of thousand dollars. Uh, Buffett started bidding on his own ukulele, I think recognizing that people were just not giving enough value to it. (laughs) But eventually it sold for $25,000. And I thought, oh my gosh, that's so much. But I really later regretted not bidding myself and trying to get it. Because if you think about the class of people that are interested in a Warren Buffett ukulele, $25,000 is not a sum that they're not going to be willing to pay. He is a legend. He has probably not done this very often. There's probably a scarcity associated with those ukuleles. This set of people see that as a very high status product to have. They could have it on display in their home, you know, in a nice glass case. And once he dies, he's quite old, then the value is likely to appreciate well beyond $25,000. Now, that sounds ridiculous for a ukulele, but I will bet that it will be worth significantly more in 30 or 40 years from now. Classic case of the social narrative and the circumstances surrounding something amplifying the value tremendously. I like that example. We've talked about art that can be aesthetically appreciated. I really am anti-ukulele. If you don't have a Hawaiian shirt on and there's a, a luau going on, I don't see the ukulele having any real purpose. You know, it's such a plingy little version of a guitar. I may just be biased against ukuleles, but that I could see where the turn sort of this really almost irritating object into a caricature of guitar into this clearly different item and it's all about the story and all about the people involved and that's just a classic case of humans embellishing an arbitrary object and turning it into something amazingly valuable. When we're thinking about this in relationship to investing it's interesting because value has progressed over the years. When Benjamin Graham wrote about net nets where people could go and purchase securities at discounts to their networking capital. These were profitable companies. Those opportunities have somewhat evaporated over time. And now so much value is based off of the discounted future cash flows of a particular business. And it's much more subjective. It's much more subject to how things develop in the future. So narratives have very powerful effects on market perception and they help to shape pricing. And that is so uncertain. And those narratives change over time as the world is dynamic and things develop. At the end of the day, 
say what something is worth is what is it worth to you personally? And then what is someone else willing to pay for it? This is one of those enormously challenging features of investing because fundamentally you're putting numbers, you're quantifying that value. And as we've talked about in this episode, there's so many very ethereal and abstract and interactive factors that give something value. That's an important core thing to keep in mind once you're feeling very certain about an investment is remember it's it's all in a sense a shared illusion, right? And circumstances can come along and change that because these values are so malleable. There's so much that we could say on this topic, but I think we've expressed that core thesis that you just outlined, Dan. And I think it's about time for us to wrap. Yeah, I'm going to go to my uh, ukulele lesson next. Sounds good. Thank you for spending your time listening to the Mental Models Podcast. Content matters because your brain does not exist in a job. Please subscribe and like Mental Models Podcast. The five-star book, Understanding Behavioral Bias, A Guide to Improving Financial Decision Making, is available through Amazon. This book will help you overcome the biases that are keeping you from investing success. The Mental Models Podcast can be found on SoundCloud, Apple Podcasts, Overcast, iHeartRadio, and Stitcher. Please subscribe and thank you for listening.